You know, Easter Sunday is the day that actually literally it splits time itself. Uh, BC and AD was formed around this particular day. There has been no greater day with greater impact, greater significance in human history than actually this day, Resurrection Sunday itself. Uh, it's far more than a religious celebration that we have. I believe this morning that what we're going to find as we jump into the story of Easter is that it's more than just a celebration. It's actually for you and I the greatest news that we can have that our King has risen and uh, he is here, he is alive today. But I love Easter. I don't know what you prepared for the day or maybe had a little bit of a breakfast this morning. I, I know for our family, uh, we're going to a lunch coming up in about an hour, an hour and a half. And uh, word on the street is that there is a, a roast that's in the works. How many of you love roast? How many of you like, like a good roast? Yes, there's roast. There's many courses. I know there's sort of dessert that's coming in there as well, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. There's nothing better at Easter than family and friends and and be able to gather together. And, and here today, we're doing the same. We're gathering together here. And then afterwards, we're going to have a bit of an Easter party outside as well. And I, I love Easter because I think Easter should be uh, a great celebration, a great party uh, that happens uh, in churches particularly uh, as we celebrate uh, the good news, as we celebrate uh, what Jesus has accomplished for us. But I actually know that you know, for some Aussies, uh, maybe because of uh, they love Easter and, and they, they love the time of Easter, but perhaps they have a different approach towards the idea even of coming to church at Easter because sometimes with the experience that we can have uh, with religion or with our background with church, maybe we found that you know church is, is not really a life-giving place. Maybe we had an experience of church where it was more uh, a dull experience or something that was more related to rules and regulations and it was a feeling of negativity that you'd walked away from perhaps a service and you felt like you didn't measure up. And uh, I read a story uh, just about this idea uh, of, of kind of what religion can do and it but actually was related to the story of, of the Sistine Chapel. And there's been some of you people here this morning, you've probably seen the Sistine Chapel uh, before, but the Sistine Chapel is, is literally, it's a masterpiece of Michelangelo. Uh, done many, many centuries ago and painted on the ceilings of the Sistine Chapel is, is really uh, an incredible uh, uh, um, um, artscape uh, that brings kind of the gospel story and God himself into this incredible focus uh, through this artwork. But, you know, for many centuries, um, art scholars and critics, they would go into the Sistine Chapel and they would be like, well, Michelangelo was definitely a, a, an incredible artist and that artwork's amazing. But but actually, it just seems like, you know, uh, he really didn't kind of have a, a great heart for um, color uh, because, you know, it just looks like it's put, you know, the paintings are kind of more monochrome. They're a little bit kind of dull in the color. And so some art critics and scholars and that perhaps, you know, pontificated that, well, maybe Michelangelo, as he painted the ceilings and he was doing this, maybe because of the dullness there, he wanted to kind of convey this image of the, the seriousness of God. Maybe that he was trying to convey this kind of the somberness of the, of the gospel story. And, uh, but in the, 80s, in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, what they did at the Sistine Chapel is that they got this team of uh, restorers and cleaners who painstakingly went through the whole of the Sistine Chapel, all of the artwork, and they began this cleaning process. Because what had happened over the centuries was because of all the religious ceremonies that had been going on in there, they'd had candles and they'd had smells and they'd had all these sorts of things that had been happening in this religious activity. What had happened was basically it produced this smoke that became a black soot that literally seeped into the very artwork itself and dulled the colors that Michelangelo had originally meant for that to be. And so when they'd finished this painstaking work of restoration to people's absolute amazement, that this tribute to God that Michelangelo had masterfully painted on the Sistine Chapel literally came to life and they discovered that actually it was filled with a vibrancy of color and a vibrancy of life they'd never known was there. And this is actually a, it's actually a great picture of what religion does, is religion has a way of discoloring the image of God. It has a way of dulling out the, the beauty and the majesty of God. And it's, it has a way of distorting what God is really like. Because really what religion is, religion is just a lot of man-made stuff. A religion is, is lots of traditions and rules. It's a lots of regulations and observances. And religion is a little bit like the smoke that tries to remove 
the color, the vibrancy, the joy, the life that there is in God. It's trying to remove the sense of, of life-giving uh, power that comes into a person's life when they begin to follow Christ. It tries to take the color from out of who God is. And perhaps your experience of church or even your experience of God, maybe at some point, has been miscolored by religion. Maybe you've had an attitude or an idea that perhaps, you know, church is negative or that God is dull. Then you know what? My hope today for you is that in this step will be, in this service today will be like a step in your transformation to transform the way that you think about God, to transform the way that you see God, to transform the way you even perceive church is to be like. Because I tell you, when someone starts a relationship with Jesus, it's never dull. It's never boring. In fact, a relationship with Jesus is life-giving. A relationship with Jesus should be filled with joy. It should be filled with love. It should be filled with fun. It should be filled with celebration. And, and this morning, that was our goal for this church service today and every church service, whether you're here with us in person or maybe you're watching online, that our goal here today is to do exactly what God, I believe, wants to do in our lives, and that's to lift people up. That you would leave here today with, with a heart maybe filled again with faith. Maybe that you leave here today with your hope lifted, with, with an encouragement and a strength in you that maybe you didn't even walk in here with. But that you wouldn't walk away from church or you'd never walk away from a moment as we gather together in church feeling guilty or feeling bad or perhaps feeling like you don't measure up. Because I tell you this, church should always be a representation of the nature of God. You know, I believe that the nature of God is a God who's filled with hope, a God who's filled with faith, a God who's filled with love and a joy and a, joy and a peace that you and I can discover when we find a relationship with God. And so today on Easter Sunday, I want to preach this morning on resurrection life, resurrection life. And, you know, I want to focus today, there's many things that, you know, you could talk about at Easter. There's many things that, 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 that Easter represents. But I want to focus today on one conversation that Jesus had with a lady by the name of Martha. And this conversation that Jesus had with Martha was actually at a moment when Martha had just suffered the loss of her brother. And after this conversation, Jesus would actually bring this brother, his name is Lazarus, back to life. But in that conversation that Jesus has with Martha is a very profound and I believe a very powerful statement that not only was Jesus making to Martha, but Jesus was actually making to us today. In the book of John chapter 11, it says this. Now, Jesus said to Martha, check these words out, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Jesus wasn't saying two different things. There's a resurrection, there's a life. He is saying that I am this resurrection life, Martha. And, and so when we need to think about Easter, we need to understand that Easter has two parts to it. We're here on Easter Sunday, but, but we actually look back, first of all, to Good Friday. And Good Friday is this. Good Friday is the day that Jesus did something for you and I that no one else could do. Good Friday is the day when Jesus paid the price for our sins. Jesus, on the Good Friday, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, what he was doing was literally stepping into the courtroom of your life and he was saying, I will take the punishment. The punishment for your sins and my sins, Jesus says, you know what? I will step into the courtroom of your life so that you will be declared not guilty and the guilt that was on you instead is going to be put on me and I will take the punishment. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. In other words, the, the penalty for sin is death. But it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gift of God is Good Friday. It's Jesus hanging on a cross with these words written above the cross. Paid in full. Jesus paid in full. Through his, through his sacrifice on the cross, he actually paid the price for your sins and for my sins. He paid the bill. I don't know if you've ever been to like a, a restaurant or a cafe 
And have you ever had that moment where someone has paid the bill for you? How do you know that's a very good feeling? It's a great moment. I remember when Wendy and I went to a cafe a little while ago, we were sitting there and, and Wendy just felt in their heart to, to pay for someone else's bill that was there. We didn't know the person and so we went up and we just, we paid the bill for them. And then we went and sat back down and when that person, this man went to then pay the bill, they'd said, I'm sorry, sir, you don't need to pay the bill because someone else has paid for it and then kind of pointed it out. I tell you what, you should have seen the look of astonishment on their face that someone else who really we didn't have a relationship with would, would step in there and pay the bill for them. How many of you know that in some ways is exactly what Jesus did for you and I, but at a far higher level, is that he stepped in on our behalf and he paid a bill that we could not pay. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the bill, he paid the price so you and I could be made right with God. But can I tell you, Good Friday doesn't finish there. Not only did Jesus pay the price and pay the bill for us so that we could be forgiven and so that you and I could be made perfectly right with God, but the Bible says that Jesus also defeated the devil and he won a victory over every single work of the enemy. Listen to the words of Jesus himself. This is our resurrected king speaking in Revelation. Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead. So he's talking about when he went to the grave. I am he who lives and was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. I love it that it says, amen. Don't you love it how Jesus just amens himself right there in that moment? He's like, amen. And I'll, but listen to what he says. And I have the keys of Hades, that's hell, and of death. Do you know what keys represent? Keys represent power and authority. Whoever has keys has power and has authority. Have you ever lost your keys before? Anyone had that experience? You ever lost your keys before? I have that experience relatively regularly in my world. How many of you know when you lose your keys, right, it's a pretty frustrating experience? It can be a pretty defeating experience if you've lost your keys for any period of time. Jesus is saying here, he's saying, I have defeated the devil. He says, I now have the keys of Hades of hell and death. Jesus is saying this, that listen, the devil, he's so defeated, he no longer has the keys anymore to his own house. He lost them. He says, I now have the keys over hell and over death. So see, here's the good news. Jesus took the keys of hell and death from the devil 2,000 years ago. And guess what? He has no plans whatsoever of giving them back. The devil is so defeated, he lost those keys 2,000 years ago, and he's never getting them back. And whoever has the keys has the power. And so Good Friday means that Jesus actually has now the power and the ultimate authority over sin, over death, over hell, and over eternal life. And if that's good news, give the Lord a great hand this morning. That's, that's just Good Friday, people. Like We haven't got to Easter Sunday yet. That's just Good Friday. So what's Easter Sunday all about then? If, if Jesus has done all that for us at Calvary, if he's accomplished all that for us on the cross, then What's Easter Sunday all about? What, what's the resurrection all about? Well, the resurrection is all about new life. It's, it's all about you and I not thinking that, you know what? Well, now that I've been made right with God, now that I've been forgiven for my sins, to, you know, I just sit back now and I just, just go through life and maybe I just try to be the best person I can be. And then when I get to heaven, that's, that's, that's great. I'll experience something up there that's awesome. No, 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 no. Jesus here is talking about that Good Friday is about the time and the price that he paid for our sins. But Easter Sunday, his resurrection, is that Jesus has now given us a new life to live. Easter Sunday is about that death has been defeated, but also that Jesus now has resurrection life for you and I. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Jesus was actually talking about a kind of life that he wants you and I to experience, not just in heaven, but actually here on earth. Jesus was talking about not just a time when we go to heaven and maybe we'd experience a life that we've never experienced before. Jesus was saying there is resurrection life for you to live a new life that's, that's very different to the life you once had here on earth. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I'm resurrection life. You know that word life there? It's the word zoe in the Greek. That word zoe life 
appears 138 times in the New Testament. 138 times in the New Testament. It speaks of experiencing Zoe life. Now, what you need to understand is this, is Zoe life doesn't mean human life. It's not like, it doesn't mean like life, like biological life, human life. Uh, today, Easter Sunday, uh, is actually also our eldest daughter's 17th birthday today. She shares it with Easter Sunday. I'm not sure if she's here in the service this morning, but she's 17th birthday. And um, thinking back to 17 years ago, to this day, you know, as a parent, there's a moment where, you know, the child, your child is born and then you literally pick up that child in your hands. And there's that sense of the miracle of life. And it's a wonderful moment. And, and, but Jesus was saying, I'm the resurrection and the life. He wasn't talking about when we're born. He didn't mean human life. Jesus was talking when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He wasn't talking about human life. He was talking about spiritual life. Jesus was talking about a spiritual life that comes directly from God into our hearts and into our world. Resurrection life that Jesus was speaking about was a new life that God wants us to live here on earth. It was about a life-giving power and a life-giving love that could begin to go to work in us and through us because Jesus has been raised from the dead. But you know what? In life, there's all sorts of things, isn't there, that, that we find life-giving. All sorts of things that we can find that are life-giving to us. You know, relationships are life-giving, aren't they? Yeah, especially after we've had moments, and, and we've had some of those even the last week, we've had moments of being locked down where we, we can't gather, we can't you know, have the normal relationship moments that we'd have through our week. But relationships are, are life-giving. You know, meeting with people is life-giving. You know, just catching up and talking and laughing with friends and family is life-giving. Maybe today it's having a meal together. It's, it's a life-giving moment. You know, I find, you know, things like people find exercise and sport, they're, they're life-giving. Maybe your thing is to, to go for a walk. Maybe your thing is you love to go to the gym. Maybe for you it's riding a bike or maybe it's swimming or, or maybe, you know, your form of exercise is more what happens between the couch and the fridge, between a Netflix moment or whatever. But, you know, what exercise and, and physical activity and sport, they, they can be life-giving to us. You know, uh, I think watching sport is life-giving. Very much so. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Queensland Reds supporter. And so for about the last 30 years of my life, it hasn't been a very life-giving experience following my Queensland Reds as they languished at the bottom of the table. In fact, I love to say this, God made me a Queensland Reds supporter so I could actually be taught long-suffering and patience. So God has done a full and complete work in me in the last 30 years in that regards. But in the last year, things have begun to turn. Last year, we started to move up in the world. Halfly, half, mainly because there's only five teams in the competition now. But, but having said that, we're now at the top of the table, right? And so I find that, you know, watching sport is life-giving. I, I love going to a stadium with a group of people just to be in that atmosphere, that environment. It, it gives life. Uh, social activities, they're, they're life-giving. You know, barbecues, trips to the beach. Maybe it's going to your favorite cafe or restaurant or hanging out in groups with people. Maybe it's Maybe, you know, your thing is more movies. You'll have to go and watch a movie. You know, I, I just the other week we went and watched a movie, an actual movie in a movie cinema. It was called Godzilla versus King Kong. Can I tell you right now, there were no Oscars that are going to be given to Godzilla versus King Kong, but it was so good just to be in a movie cinema, eating popcorn and just being in that moment. It was a good place to be. All these things. Someone said, who won? I'm not giving it away. I'm not giving it away. You go watch it. It's all right, but I am a King Kong fan right there. But... Uh, all of these things, you know, I've spoken about, all of these things, they're, they're life-giving. But they're life-giving more to our souls, to our emotions. They're, 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 they're important things. But you know, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life, he wasn't talking about human life. He wasn't talking about like a life that we find life-giving things that happen in our soul. Jesus was talking about spiritual life. Do you know spiritual life is the most powerful life that there is? Spiritual life is actually a life that comes directly from God into our world. Spiritual life happens when we connect with Jesus. It literally is like this. It's like the, the picture I have, it's like when you have an appliance around the home that's been unplugged and then you plug that into the power source and you flick the switch on 
And suddenly this kind of surge of power begins to operate into that appliance. And then that appliance literally is able to do what it's created or designed to do. Only because it's connected to the power source. You and I are exactly the same. We have been designed or created by God, but we've actually been created to be plugged into the power source, which is Christ himself, so that his resurrection life can begin to flow through us so that you and I can live the life that we have been created to live, so that you and I can do the things that God has called us to do, and so that you and I could experience the fullness of the life that Christ died and rose again for us to experience. But we can only experience Zoe life, abundant life, when we're connected to our Savior, when we're connected to God. And when you and I are connected to God, what happens is this Zoe life, it begins to flow into us and then it begins to flow through us into others. You know, we uh, just recently, we, we moved house and uh, we moved uh, into a place uh, that actually is on a little bit of acreage. And uh, it's, it's been funny because we're on a bit of acreage, but literally it's like we've been transported to living on like a farm kind of environment, which we're not like that at all. And so uh, we kind of are learning a little bit about the rural nature of being in the house that we're in. And so this house is like 90 years old, okay? So it was built at a time when it was definitely rural. And so one morning, as we're doing all the morning things, everyone's having their showers in the morning, getting ready for school and work and everything else. Suddenly, in the middle of that morning, the hot water just stopped in a moment. And normally, you'd go out and go, okay, what's the hot water system? What's going on? Is something broken? And, but it was only after we did a bit of investigation, we discovered that actually, the hot water system in our home, the water system was not connected to the council water, where you have like a, a, like a, a continuous underground supply. It was actually connected to a tank. And that tank was positioned up on these kind of stilts up very high. So literally in the middle of everyone having their showers in the morning, the hot water just dies in that moment. How many of you know that's like the worst first world problem right there? Losing all the hot water. Not good in that moment. And so we kind of after a bit of investigation, eventually we discovered there was this pump that was downstairs in like the basement area that you had to fire this pump up. And what happened was it would pump then water from one of the other tanks up into the top tank and refill it. And an hour later, we were able to get, <laughs> tap back into the water supply and be able to have some hot water in our home. But here's the thing. We've just gotten so used to, in our lives, having this continuous water supply that would never run out. When Jesus spoke to a woman, it's called the woman at the well story. When Jesus spoke to a woman in the Bible, he spoke to a woman at a time in her life when she knew something was missing in her heart, missing in her life. And Jesus begins this conversation with her. And, and, and look, let me just preface this by saying, it's amazing how many times that God shows up in our life uh, at the times we very much need him to show up. Actually, many times there are times in our life where they're tough times or difficult moments. And, and in those moments, I've found that actually God comes closest. And this woman, you know, she'd actually had a lot of relationships in her life that had not worked out. And there was no doubt whatsoever that there was, there was hurt and probably some brokenness there, some, definitely some disappointment. And, and she'd been trying to find fulfillment and meaning in relationships, and, and she wasn't finding it there. She'd find it for a period of time, and then it, it would eventually just run out and it wouldn't work out. And so she's at this point where she's searching for something. She's looking for something, and, and Jesus turns up and begins this conversation with her. And, but what Jesus knew was that this woman... Uh, had a thirst that was not being quenched by anything else in this life. And so Jesus spoke to her, and these are the words. He says, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, meaning it, 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 she was drinking from out of uh, supplies that were never designed for her to find satisfaction and fulfillment in. She, she was looking for relationships. She was looking for experiences. She was looking for, for things in this world. But she said she'd drink from them, but then she'd get thirsty again. And Jesus says, if you keep drinking from those wells, from those sources, you will thirst again and again and again. But he said to her, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give you will become in you a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Here's this word, zoe life again. 
In other words, Jesus is saying to this woman, you know what, you, you've had physical things, natural things, and you've tried to find fulfillment. You've tried to quench that thirst in you, but you keep coming back again and you're thirsty again and again. You've, you've had experiences in life and, and you thought that you'd find something there, but actually you come back again and you find that, that you need to, to fulfill that thirst again. And, but Jesus was saying to her, he says, I've got a source. I've, I've got a supply. I, I've got this, this life that you can tap into. And, and if this life, if this living water begins to flow in you, you will never be thirsty again. In other words, what Jesus is saying to this woman is this, is that, you know what, I've got this source of life, this resurrection life, that actually when it comes alive on the inside of you, it will spring up within you. It's a source of life that's not dependent on an experience. It's a, it's a source of life that's not dependent on another person. It's a source of life that's not dependent on the circumstances that are around your life. It's dependent only on your connection with God. It's spiritual life. And Jesus is saying to this woman, you can have this supernatural spring that's inside you that will bring so much life to you, so much joy to you, so much fulfillment to you. What Jesus was talking about was a, a resurrection life that he wanted to give her that would start the very moment that she would connect in relationship with him. And I tell you, when you talk about resurrection life, I think the best way you can talk about it is moments when you've experienced that somehow God is in a place. Somehow God is in an atmosphere. You know, we talk about it this way, like the presence of God. Maybe you've experienced even a little bit that this morning. Maybe it was in the worship. There was a sense of God's presence. Maybe you're watching online this morning, and maybe even in these moments right now, you're sensing the presence of God reaching out to you this morning. You know what the presence of God is? It's just a very powerful and real sense that God is near. God is near. And I tell you, one touch from God can fill you like nothing else can. One touch from God can satisfy you like nothing in this world ever can. One touch from God can actually be better than any experience or any other moment that we can have in life. Because one touch from God can change our heart and one touch from God can change our future. And I want to tell you this morning, the good news of Easter Sunday, that's why Jesus rose again, so that you and I could have this resurrection life that could spring up within us and flow out from us. And tell you what, our prayer today as a church for every person that's here today is this, on Easter Sunday, that you would just do more than celebrate Easter, although to celebrate Easter is amazing. Our prayer today is that you and I wouldn't just celebrate Easter, but that you and I would experience Easter. Jesus wants you to experience Easter for yourself that you would experience His resurrection life, His love, His power at work in your life. And you know what I find sometimes in life, we have to go through tough seasons in life in order to really begin to search for answers. You know, I know this woman at this time, she was going through some tough moments in her life, but here's what I've discovered. You know, trials or difficulties or challenges in life, they sometimes have a way of just stripping everything back so that you and I would begin to search for answers. And I've discovered this in life. The answer to the questions that I've had in life always begin with connecting in relationship with Jesus, with His life. And sometimes in life, you know, the trials we walk through have a way of leading us towards God, not actually away from Him. C.S. Lewis said it this way, sometimes pain is God's megaphone to get our attention. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe God's actually been trying to get your attention for a while now. I tell you, the reason He wants to get your attention is because He loves you so much. He does. He loves you so much. And He's been wanting and He's been waiting to come into your life, to come into your world. He wants to change your heart, forgive you, heal you, and give you His resurrection life, a joy, a satisfaction, a fulfillment, a new life in Him that we would never find anywhere else.